go. Session number three. Um, yesterday we dealt with Morocco during the Second World War, and today we shift to other regions of North Africa. So we and uh, Joanne's paper deal with Algeria, the topic of Daniel. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, We have here. The topic of Daniel Lee's paper is Tunisia as well as Algeria, and Hattis Bernhardt focuses on Libya. We discussed today new regions, but the structure remains the same. It means 20 minutes presentation, 30 minutes discussion. I am pleased to introduce you to Dr. Sophie Roberts, who received her PhD in history and to research is from the University of Toronto. Since 2011, she is Zenfer Assistant Professor of Jewish History and Jewish Studies at the University of Kentucky. Sophie is currently a visiting scholar at the Tauf Center for Jewish Studies at Stanford University. Um, her first manuscript entitled The Limits of Citizenship, Jews, Citizenship and Anti-Semitism in French Colonial Algeria focuses on the, on the competition for control of municipal government in colonial Algeria. And this uh, manuscript is currently under review at Cambridge University Press. Her latest research is on Jewish responses to Vichy and Semitic legislation in North Africa, for which she received the Sussman Foundation Fellowship at the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum. <laughs> and um, Sophie's talk is about to remain in the shadow of the tricolor flag, Jews, citizenship, and Vichy in French colonial Algeria, 1940 and 1940. Yeah. Uh, and thank you to the organizers for making this possible, for inviting me to be a part of this fantastic forum. It's been an absolute pleasure already, so hopefully we'll stay that way. Um, so, of course, I apologize. I sent the last paper. So, to all of you who read it last night, I hope it put you to sleep and had a nice rest. Um, it's very detailed. I'm playing a lot with primary sources at this time. I'm trying to wade through everything that I collected, both at the um, Colonial Archives in Aix-en-Provence and also the Holocaust Archives. So, I'm, I'm working through all the Holocaust Museum archives working through all of these materials, and uh, as Omar can tell you, he told me to publish on this topic much earlier, but I'm still taking my time. Um, and I'm, I'm working through these different ideas. So there are essentially three goals of my current project, and they're reflected in this paper, and I think that they speak to what we're trying to do as a group. I also told you recently I'm going to try to stay under 20 minutes, and I'm going to work on that. I'm going to make it happen. Um, <laughs> so the first goal. And the, the title of my next project is Appealing to Vichy, and talking about appeals, how Jews spoke back, how they talked back to Vichy. And looking at not only the letters that they send into the government, and this reflects a lot of what Orik was talking about yesterday, but how they wrote to one another. When theoretically no one is at the receiving end, is there still the same kind of language? Is it still the same kind of representation? And so this paper is showing you some of those different sources. And thinking about how these Algerian Jews in particular are talking about themselves and also talking to the government about themselves. So the first of the three goals is exactly that of Jewish responses, trying to incorporate this approach to North African Jews in World War II into our broader study of World War II and the Holocaust, looking at how Jews responded. Um, and a, a word of caution, and one that we kind of talked about yesterday, which is that when we're working to integrate a, an area into a broader study, we have to be careful not to lose the specificity of it. So that's, that's a note of caution and one that I'm constantly thinking about as I talk about these Algerian Jews. It wasn't the same experience as in Europe, but there are a lot of similarities that we can't undermine because it's theoretically on the periphery. So that's my first goal. The next goal is thinking about how Jews and Muslims responded to this issue of rights 
and questions of belonging and identity. So part of what this paper seeks to do is to talk about, in the immediate aftermath of the anti-Semitic legislation, how did Jews and Muslims respond? How did they react? How did they look to one another as excluded, long excluded, newly excluded parts of this broader community? And situating World War II in this longer trajectory of seeking rights within this French colony. Now, probably everybody knows, but I'm still going to tell you because I like to teach. Algeria is unique because Algerian Jews were French citizens. They were made French citizens in 1870. They lose that citizenship in 1940. So that's 70 years of citizenship. That's a generation, more than a generation. So the people who lose their citizenship in 1940 are losing the only identity that they've known for the most part. And that is a real sense of rupture. So we're talking about this idea of rupture as well. And uh, so those were two goals. Third goal <laughs> is, is mostly to talk about how Jews represent themselves. And this is part of a much broader literature. Like me as well. Um, <laughs> so I've been thinking about these three aspects. So I'm not going to get into all of the background because a lot of it is already in this paper. Um, but I want to kind of get into more of the meat of it. And thinking through what I'm trying to contribute with this project. I'm looking at this idea of Jewish responses to persecution. Now we have different examples of this in continental Europe. We have Susan Zakati's study of the Jews in France. We also have this great project that the US Holocaust Museum is producing, this very long series of Jewish responses to persecution. But I want to note that it's only in the last volume that they have a section on French North Africa. So I tried to calculate. They have four volumes. It's, each one is more than 500 pages. And in all of that, it's only 10 pages on French North Africa. So it's still very, very much on the outside. And so what we're doing here today is very important. Now, the question of who's responsible. Is it Vichy? Is it Germany? This is a debate that I have no desire to get into right now. But I think we all probably agree that we, what Vichy did, they did very much for themselves. And uh, I already told Daniel that I'll mention Derrida. Derrida says very specifically that this was not Germany, this was France of itself, and uh, it, it, it is a, a very organic project. And part of my previous work has been locating this history of anti-Semitism both within the government and also the population in Algeria. And so we can see if we look over the long delay, there's this long process of anti-Semitism, and in some ways, the abrogation of the Crimea Decree, which took away Algerian Jews' citizenship, is a success for anti-Semites in some ways. So these local anti-Semites who have been trying since 1870 to abrogate the Crimea Decree, this is finally a success for them. But it also poses a great challenge for those Algerian Muslims seeking rights because it essentially says the opportunities for rights are being closed. And we see that in the paper that I sent out. Uh, another issue here is, and Susan discussed this yesterday, this issue of rupture. But I want to point out that it's not just a sense of traumatic rupture that these Jews are losing this connection to France, which they still believe in. They still believe that there's a true France and that Vichy is some form of aberration. But it's also an issue of access. And it shows the embeddedness of their French identity. They are embedded within the state to the point that they feel that they can write to Pétain, they can write to local Vichy officials, they can write to their local Quebec and say, I am French and here's why, here are my credentials. And certainly they follow a certain format and we can look to supplicant appeals as a way of trying to understand that. But it shows not only the trauma of losing their identity, but their connection to it, even still. Even though they're no longer French citizens, they still believe that they can write to government and they can write and essentially say they don't approve. Um, so an issue of understanding the context and appreciating the letters for what they are is also very important here. Now, a note about the administration. So when Jews are removed from the Algerian administration, it actually poses a huge problem. And I found letters in the archives of local administrators saying, 
now that we've removed all the Jews, what do we do? Because there's nobody left. We don't know what to do. So they're actually concerned on the basis of removing Jews. But some figures here, uh, before Vichy, there were 2,671 Jewish employees in the administration, and 2,169 were removed from their posts. Those who were able to stay somehow managed based on service or on other ways of avoiding the implication of the anti-Jewish statutes. I'm gonna do it, I'm gonna make it under 20. Um, so the other issue is that of political competition between Jewish and Muslim rights. You see the examples in the responses, but um, for example, there was a town in which Jews basically told Muslims, France took away our rights in order not to give you yours. The decision that she made against us is also directed at you. So in the aftermath of the anti-Semitic legislation, Jews are reaching out to Muslims in both positive and negative ways. There are efforts at creating Semitic unions and cooperation between Jews and Muslims, but also saying, theoretically, Vichy is saying that they've taken away our citizenship to make us equal to you, but they're basically doing it so that you cannot access your rights either. So you have lots of examples throughout the paper of what you said. And I don't want to repeat all of it, because hopefully you've had a chance to read it. And what's very fascinating about these sources is, is the language, especially in the letters that they write to one another. These are letters that don't necessarily have any particular outcome. They're just reflecting this sense of sadness and rupture. We have that mother whose daughter was taken out of school. She's no longer allowed to attend the lycée. And she calls upon this France of, uh, of Descartes, of Pascal, of Fanon, Pasteur, calling upon this France that she has grown to love and idolize. And one that she doesn't understand how that France is now Vichy. And it's very traumatic for her. Uh, a source that I recently discovered, so it's not in the paper itself, is from a, a young Algerian Jewish teacher named Edmund, and he's writing to his parents in November 1940, and I'm just going to share little bits of this letter, because it's really, it's incredibly eloquent, and, and really very sad, and it, I think it reflects this idea that Edmund had only known a French identity. He had only known his life as a French citizen. So to lose that citizenship and lose his job as a teacher, this is traumatic for him. So he writes, today is November 11th. I watched my little pupils sadly. I spoke to them with my heart, with emotion of the glorious dead buried on the battlefields. I felt the tears forcing themselves in my eyes, my throat tightened, pressed painfully by a deep sob. They ignored my secret pain, them, candid, small, pure, my heart bled because I felt how much recent events have impacted me. I thought with despair, but I'm the same. I did not change. These little ones have heard me talk about their country with warmth, with force, and with even more conviction than I would want to judge myself, since one cannot judge the sad microcosm that I represent. I do not know if the little students perceive the alteration of my faith, as the class breathed in an almost religious silence. It causes me so much pain to think that I will leave them soon. I got so used to the little ones. What a joy to instill in these new souls such virtues that will later make them the honest, the good citizen, the ideal towards which I have committed my mind and my heart. I consider myself before God and man as a Frenchman of heart and mind. Nothing will change me. The land of France will never change either. The sky, the sun, her whole face will always find me moved and grateful for her beauty, her goodness. Because I sense it will remain with me in the depths of my being, the unfailing mark of the spirit, of reason, of being French. It remains intact due to my teaching that I received in French schools. My behavior in my external life, as in my internal life, in its most secret meaning, will always be French. This letter was not sent to anyone who had any power over Edmund's future. It was sent to his parents, but it really reflects this deep pain this deep sense of loss that he's no longer considered a French citizen. But he says, time after time, that I'm the same. I haven't changed. Another aspect of these sources are the appeals themselves. And this, again, echoes what Auric did yesterday, 
but these petitions and appeals to maintain citizenship. And I gave you the one that is the source of the title of my paper from Renée Zerbib, who was a widow of a World War I veteran, and makes her claim not only on her status as a mother, but on the service of her husband. And she has that fantastic language that we see in these letters of thanking Pétain, who she says is a dear father to her, so playing into the language and rhetoric of the National Revolution as well, she says, I dare to count on your kindness to get a favorable opinion to my query. And during this wait, I assure you of my deep respect and complete dedication as a passionate French woman. She asks to, be re to remain under the shadow of the tricolor flag, which was the motto of her dead husband. You have other examples as well that I, I won't repeat constantly. Um, but there's one piece that I hope to get some help from the group here which is that I'm starting to look at Algerian Jews who were in Morocco and how this created a very complicated situation, especially for those whose parents were Moroccan, but they were born, the, the individual were born in Algeria. Because they, in fact, many of them are able to maintain their citizenship on the basis that it's not due to the Crimea decree, but to an 1889 decree that allowed the children of foreign parents to, who were born on French soil to be considered French citizens. So it creates this whole complicated issue, not just of how these Jews talk back, but how the administration deals with the intricacies of this legislation. So the Moroccan cases are, are also fairly interesting, and they use very similar language as well. So even though it's a different case, these Jews are using much the same language. Um, you have two examples in the paper, so I'm not going to repeat them. Uh, and I'm going to try to quickly conclude. <coughs> I'm going to do it. Um, <laughs> so my conclusion and the questions I want to ask of the group and also to ask in this broader project is how do we understand these, these letters? both the letters to, from Jews to other Jews, but also these appeals. How do we understand them for what they are? How do we understand them within this broader context of World War II, looking not just at how North Africans, Jewish North Africans responded, but also how Jews in continental Europe responded as well. So looking at that in a comparative perspective, but while also very clearly maintaining the specificity of the North African context. And that is a great challenge of this project for me. And also emphasizing the sense of rupture, the sense of trauma that we can see so very clearly in these letters. They're really quite extraordinary that the language that is used in them, that letter from Edmund, the first time I read it, I almost cried, it was so powerful. The sense of great loss shows not only the history and the impact of 70 years of citizenship on Algerian Jews, but also the connections that they have to Europe. So when we're thinking about these connections across the Mediterranean, we can see that very clearly here. Uh, so I will end with a little quote of Derrida from his uh, monolingualism of the other, which for me is very hard to understand, but this piece was very, very clear. And he's critiquing, <laughs> I admit fully, I don't understand that. But uh, he's critiquing this very strange version of citizenship that Algerian Jews experience. A citizenship that theoretically cannot be taken away. Citizenship cannot <coughs> be removed unless there was a specific reason for it on an individual basis. So to take away citizenship from a massive group was technically illegal by French law. And so he's writing that he doesn't understand this. He says, a citizenship in essence does not emerge like that. This is not natural. But by this artifice and insecurity, it appears better as in the clarity of a privileged revelation when citizenship is in the memory of a recent acquisition. For example, the French citizenship granted to Algerian Jews by the Crimea Decree in 1870, or in the memory of a traumatic degradation, loss of citizenship, for example, of the loss of French citizenship for the same Jews of Algeria less than a century later. Such was indeed the case under the occupation, as they say. Yes, as they say, because in truth, it is a legend. Algeria has never been occupied. I mean, if it has never been occupied, it was certainly not by the German occupation. The withdrawal of the French citizenship from the Jews of Algeria, with all that ensued, 
it was the fact because of only the French. They decided this on their own, in their heads. They had dreamed of it forever. They implemented it on their own. So we can see he's very much blaming the French for what happened. And this is a feeling that was shared by some Algerian Jews, although not expressed in the same way. So with that, I will stop in advance of the 20 minutes and open it up. And hopefully there will be wonderful questions that I will not be able to answer. <laughs> so thank you for this presentation. Um, I have a couple of questions and some accolades also. I'm just so happy to hear that you're also looking at the Algerians in Morocco because before you said I've been writing that I'm curious and that. Um, because the founder of the Moroccan Communist Party is one of such a piece of character, so I'm happy to share with you the materials I have from him if you don't already have it. Um, but that's just, I wonder what are the many, the many possible directions that these deals take, right? For him, he just pushes him toward more legal activism and he ends up representing more refugees, not necessarily Jewish, all these sorts of things. But many other Algerian Jews in similar positions in Morocco take a totally opposite stance and do what you say, like if you have to directly, that sort of thing. Um, so that leads me to the question of, a variegated definition of Algerian Jewishness um, and their understanding of French citizenship or lack thereof. I have in mind Sherestein's work on the, so the Saharan Jews, yeah. right? So how does that fit into your picture if it does it all? Um, and how you're treating the category of Algerian in this, this, I mean, you're hinting at this wonderful porosity of French empire that in a way she enables by just by, by abrogating Great questions. Should I collect? Okay. Do you want to? Do you want to collect? Well, this it follows a little bit in the lines of your um, almost question. Um, but I'm, you know, listening to you, I'm you're almost blown away by the the power of Frenchness and the, you know the civilizing mission and and. And you know, in your presentation, which I, you know, I'm, you know, I've looked at some a lot of these appeal letters too, and you know, I'm always struck by that. But I'm wondering if there's a either another way to read into some of these letters uh, and appeals, or other letters which sort of present some kind of counter, you know, counter narrative, um, uh, you know, sort of more of a somehow reflection of of being kind of a colonized Jew despite the, um, you know, despite the, <laughs> the power of, the, of, the, of, the, of the citizenship. And I think in a way it, 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 it relates to your question about, you know, the Moroccan connection. Uh, because, um, you know, especially during, during the Vichy period, there were a lot of uh, uh, Jews who, of Moroccan origin who had lived in Algeria and acquired citizenship of the, and the authorities were tremendously concerned about these different loopholes that they wanted to cover up, you know, people who somehow escaped, uh, you know, the Cremieux decree and could still be regarded as citizens. But there were other kinds of appeals um, um, based on this notion of uh, perpetual Moroccan citizenship, which went back to the Madrid Treaty, um, which essentially said that, you know, that someone who returns to Morocco over a certain period of time then would be considered, um, you know, if it's, if it's the same or longer period of time that they were outside, then they would be considered Moroccan. And, and although that wasn't the intention, that becomes the basis of Moroccan citizenship. Um, and so there were certainly, there were some who were appealing, you know, appealing in a sense for their Moroccanness, because in a way the, being a Moroccan, uh, considered indigenously Moroccan, and this included some of the Algerians, you know, could be seen as advantageous over being uh, French, because there, were, there was kind of a, although it was more or less the same, there were sort of separate, separate parts of the Dahirs, about the, the anti-Jewish uh, Dahirs regarding 
rock and a non-rock and Jew. So, so that that provide you know in a way that sort of provides also a counter narrative to being you know the Frenchness of, uh, you know, of uh, and, and the appeals that you uh, you know you, in a sense have been competing with that. Um, so it's an, maybe an observation and. Uh, Oh, okay. <laughs> all right. Ooh, so many questions. Um, so thank you already. This is very helpful. Uh, and Alma, thank you. I will be taking you up on that offer very, very soon. Um, this issue of Algerianness and different groups of Algerians, I am certainly guilty of exactly what Sarah Stein says is a problem of studies of Algerian Jews, which is that I say all Algerian Jews when there are very clearly distinctions among Algerian Jews. So the case of the Saharan Jews is entirely different because they did not benefit from the Crimea Decree and they were not made citizens as a result of it. Uh, I didn't feature any of these letters in this paper, but I've started to come across letters from Saharan Jews who have received citizenship on other bases other than the Crimea Decree. And for the most part, they can maintain their citizenship because it wasn't the Crimea Decree. So there are some examples there. Um, yeah. <laughs> so um, there's a lot of variation among Algerian Jews, and you know, especially as I work through the early part of this project, I use that as a catch-all, but it's not right. It needs to be better distinguished. And when this turns into a bigger project, I will focus more on the other communities. And I think that this, this issue, and this gets to what Daniel is talking about as well, is there's a really interesting transnational element to North African Jews that I'm starting to realize. When I started this project, I thought I would do Morocco, Algeria, Tunisia, and look at different appeals. But I'm starting to think that maybe I will keep working with Algerian Jews, but look at them within a transnational perspective, and look at how Algerian Jews in Morocco dealt with the differences, that some are following the same path as their Algerian Jewish, and again, I'm falling into the same trap again, but the same path as those who wrote to government seeking to maintain citizenship and are appealing to this, you know, true, brilliant France and Peyton's wonderful, dear father, tricolor flag. But there are others who are, and I think that there really is a counter narrative that I think is quite interesting and one that I haven't had a chance to deal with yet. So I. I'm unequipped to respond, but <laughs> thinking through this, is, it's very interesting. And there are even cases of Algerian Jews who don't follow this path, who are immediately reaching out to Muslims in different ways as well, and creating new bonds, saying, like, we are the same. And this French citizen, which was citizenship, which was so artificial, is now gone. So now we can move forward and create these opportunities together. So. You know, there, there is an interesting variety of responses, and this is just one piece, and I'm totally overwhelmed by the number of sources I've collected and unfortunately photographed many of them, and therefore have no idea what's in my massive collection of hard drives. So this is just the start. This is the tip of the iceberg, and there's a lot more to go. Seven questions, please, then, and Orit. Yeah, thank you very much for your presentation. By listening to you, it triggered uh, in my mind some kind of, 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 of not so such a strange comparison uh, between the whole process of uh, emancipation in France and its continuation into Algeria. Um, reading your story or listening to you uh, concerning the reaction to the operation of the uh, the um, Well, first of all, I thought about. The whole process of, well, civilizing the French Jews by, uh, uh, the Algerian Jews by French Jews, mm -hmm. at the basis of the experience of the French bureaucracy in the second world war, uh, concerning the Alsacian Jews. Mm -hmm. The same bureaucrats moved from Alsace to Algeria in order to emancipate the Jews, with all the differences, and and even the, I would say even the well. Uh, irritations between uh, French Jews, former Alsatian Jews coming to Algeria with the Algerian Jews. It's tried, not just a tribe between Ashkenazi and Islam Jews. It goes much, much deeper. And you were just talking about it for 70 years. It's really messy generation. 
and a half. But at the backdrop, let's say, of, of German or Central European history, it sounds very, very familiar. After 1933, when German Jews were appealing to the uh, German uh, the Vice President Hindenburg, that is very, very similar concerning their military service, their emancipation, and it, it just, uh, there's no, there's no um, uh, causality, but 1870 was the German date as well, concerning the German Jews and, and the final, well, emancipation, receiving citizenship. Uh, like, like the Algerian Jews in 1870, but going back into Prussian history, for instance, after the Prussian edict, 1812, if you would look at the map, let's say, of German Jewish emancipation, it's still exactly the same differences. The Jews of the Pozna region in Russia, yeah, how they were emancipated in, well, not juxtaposition, but in difference, let's say, to other Jews in Germany and coming back to France in order to close uh, the circle. Uh, the Jews of Bordeaux and the Jews of Alsace and the Jews of, of the Provence, yeah, the, you will find it exactly the same, the same structure, the same fabric, yeah, when and how Jews were emancipated and received the proper citizenship, and how things well repeated themselves by the abrogation of citizenship. The whole story repeats itself. So that came just into my mind listening to yeah. The Algerian question is extremely, well, the one and extremely complicated on the other very high open. It's unbelievable. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 And that's the great challenge of that, you know, looking into this broader perspective but not losing the specificity yeah. of the case because it, it is such a profound parallel of what's going on in Europe as well. And, you know, the way in which Jews are also Algerian Jews will later reach out to international Jewish organizations in trying to regain their citizenship. So they write to the AJC, the WJC, and so they do consider themselves, at least the elite, considers themselves within an international perspective. And they do think through the other cases of Jews and how they are fighting to retain or regain an identity. I don't want to bother you with this question because I'm not too directly related, but if you look at the biography and the activities of Rabbi Kassan, you will exactly find that story. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we'd like to connect two additional questions on it at the end. Um, yeah. <laughs> Everyone. Everyone. <laughs> <laughs> so please, okay. Uh, thank you very much. It was really, I mean, our papers really overlap in an in interesting way. Um, I wonder, you mentioned uh, the, the um, or you touch upon Jewish-Muslim relationship and how, what Vichy period had, what kind of impact we had. And I wonder if we don't have here a kind of wishful thinking of when we talk about Vichy period or, because myself I wrote this a bond of paria, I call it bond of paria in my paper uh, when, when uh, Jews felt closer to the Muslim uh, um, partners in, in Morocco, and maybe in some cases of the elite it was the case, but the majority, maybe we have to look at the Vichy period as something that widened the rupture between Muslim and Jews. And I just wonder about it, and if, if, you, if you have some information, or, or in the letter, if there were mention of, of Muslims or uh, uh, maybe it, it exists, but in mo more popular culture, in musician, I don't know crazy musicians, for example, and, and that were very. In, in, I, I know from my family in, in Constantin that um, the father of uh, Enrico Macias uh, was really attached to to the other Muslim musicians, but those people didn't write the, the play. Uh, the, the, the music, but maybe to look at it, but it's, I think it's, it's a much more complicated question. Or what was the impact of Vichy period on Muslim Jews' relationship? This is just an anecdote, and, but also it's very well uh, related to what you're doing. I recently uh, got an, uh, an email from uh, uh, Mohammed Dawood's uh, uh, son, who is actually somewhere in Princeton, uh, around Princeton. And 
he sent me a, a, a document that lists all the archives that they have about Algerian Jews who came to Morocco and listen, and, and these are basically related to the Spanish, the Spanish uh, uh, colonial authorities, or, and how Moroccan Jews in the north as well as in the areas under the control of the French will complain about these Algerian Jews now, who now the French that don't want them, and now they are after they didn't even want to share French French citizenship with the Moroccans after 1870. Now they are coming because nobody wants it. So what's really interesting about these resources, these documents, is that they tell us these frictions that have always existed between Moroccan Jews and Algerian Jews. And I think looking at these documents, I think it probably will shed light more on what happened during the Vichy period. But also, you have also to read it, I think, you have to go back, for, as Daniel said, you have to go back to the uh, European treaties. After 1880, all these European treaties, I think they would read there, there. They would help you, in a, in a certain way, contextualize your historical readings of what happened during this moment. Because I think it's preceded, there's always this tension. I remember when I was reading um, Marco Shiabi Soror, this Jew from Akka who goes to France, to Algeria, and he was facing all kinds of trouble to get the citizenship in 18, around 1881, because that the Algerian Jews did not want him, want him to be part of this. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so I have just two, two small things. The first thing is, I think these distinctions in terms of nationality and citizenship that you, you, you told us about was definitely noticed by, by Vichy. Um, and one thing you, I'm sure you know about, but you, you, you didn't have time to talk about, was the fact that a lot of Europeans in North Africa at that time, in Algeria, who perhaps had come to Algeria, perhaps in the 1920s, became citizens in the 20s. They didn't lose their citizenship either. So there was a lot of cases, which, I, I mean, I've written about this elsewhere, but whatever, it's, it's just to do with the fact that there was definitely Vichy was saying, well, hold on a minute, we've got these Algerians who fought for France in World War I who have lost their citizenship. And now we've got these Romanians and these Polish who have just acquired citizenship and their citizens and the others aren't. So I think that's also quite an interesting um, thing to look at. But my, my question was, I mean, what I found so interesting about your selection of quotes was so many were written by women. And and you, you it, I'm quoting you, you said they follow a certain format, these letters. So I'm, I'm curious if you could perhaps comment on these you know, this gender aspect of these letters. I mean, do sort of perhaps, are women writing in a different way to men, or what have you noticed in terms of these formats? Okay. <laughs> um, okay, I will, I will go very quickly. Uh, for Ari, on the issue of Jewish-Muslim relationship, yeah, it, it's very easy to fall into this trope of like, all of a sudden they were equal, and then they were, you know, friends, but that's totally not true. In fact, there was an increase in anti-Semitic activity in general in Algeria in the aftermath in the in the 40s, throughout the 40s, actually. So I, I mentioned that the PPF is is getting very uh, active and stirring up trouble and trying also to recruit Muslims in particular to join their ranks. There's also this issue of uh, you know there's almost a competitive quality. Oh. <laughs> There's, a, there's almost a competitive quality a quality to these discussions between Jews and Muslims, like who has it worse? And the Jews sometimes make the argument that we in fact now have it worse because while you have your personal status, we no you longer don't. can do that and we, we no longer have any of these you know, religious, uh, indigenous institutions. They've gone away over 70 years, so we're returned to a status that no longer exists. So essentially they're in a, a no man's land, a political no man's land. And the, it, it almost becomes a one-upping between them, like, oh, well, we've never been citizens, or we're now in a worse situation. So there's a lot of distance between them. I haven't seen much in terms of the letters themselves, but rarely in the letters do they mention Muslims. I haven't seen it. It doesn't mean it doesn't exist, because there's still a lot to go, but I, I, don't, I haven't seen much of it. More I see it in um, surveillance reports of the police 
saying that we see more violence popping up between Jews and Muslims, or we see that you know there there are reports of you know people calling a Jew a dirty Jew, or you get what you deserve, and so there there are reports of it, but I haven't seen it in letters, so that that doesn't answer anything. Uh, <laughs> Omar, thank you, great advice. I need to follow all of it, and there's still a lot I need to look into, and the whole issue of citizenship. I've discovered, I used to think it was a very simple thing, but it is incredibly complicated and complex, and there are all these different issues regarding citizenship in different um, dimensions, but also different contexts. The European treaties are definitely something I need to look into. Uh, Daniel, the issue of Europeans in Algeria is an important one, and one that ends up being very, uh, very, troubling for Algerian Jews because they say, how, how did these, you know, they call them, you know, the Europeans of a, of a fresh date. <laughs> how are they maintaining their citizenship and we're not after all of our service? And it does seem that Vichy is very aware of what they're doing. And I found reports among administrators saying, like, how do we, how are we planning on doing this? Like, there's even confusion among prefects of how, how did they even implement this? How did they identify who can you know, be excused or accepted from this law, or even the census. There, there's so much confusion over how to conduct the census, and who has to report in, and who doesn't. And there are a series of appeals about the census regarding um, parents who cannot figure out if their children need to be reported as Jews or not based on when they were born and also baptized, particularly among these intermarried families. Um, so there's, there's an enormous amount of confusion all around. And the gender question is a very interesting one. And I do find that women are writing in, in huge numbers. Um, they are often, if they're widows, they're writing in. But this, this is an interesting outlet for women. And one that is particularly fascinating because of the issue of citizenship. Not citizens yet. Yeah. I can't imagine anyone living in a French uh, uh, dominion without having some sort of status. Even so they're made French, French subjects. They're, they're called subjects. And what kind they're of called legal, French subjects. What kind of legal is that? It's a, it's a complicated one. Uh, because they are bound by French law for the most part. They theoretically, so they're basically given the same status as Algerian Muslims, but it's not quite the same because they're still ruled by French civil code, and that's the big difference. Uh, but they don't, have, they don't have voting privileges, and they don't even have the voting privileges that Algerian Muslims had access to. So are they considered indigen? They are considered indigen, but it's kind of a unique category. And I still haven't been able to perfectly articulate the specificity of that status because it's it's really really complex. They they fall into a no man's land. Susan, do you want to add that to share a question? Mm -hmm. Well, this is this is more or less a question. But I have another question too. I'm not going to open the time for it. Yeah, but I'm, I'm wondering if uh, do you have time? Yeah, sure. Uh, if you could deconstruct the the, the, the quote from Yorida, uh, Yorida, I know. Exactly sure how it fits with your presentation and what is your thinking about why this quote is so Can I your question? Just a simple question it's about Jews' French relationships during the, the, the Vichy period. Not about the administrative Vichy, it's about the French and the Jews. And the Cologne or the. the Cologne. Okay. And David? Yeah, so part of what I wanted to say, Orit had already mentioned, so what is interesting, I think, is really the relationship between the Muslim part and the Jewish part of the Algerian population. You do mention a little bit more in your paper than in this very brief presentation, so obviously that's my personal interest more, but I think it's something to work out, and then, whereas I think it's probably really interesting to look at the comparison to Europe and, and, and those things, I mean, there's also a, a clear difference, right? So in Europe, the Jews are at the bottom of the food chain, Right, but in Nigeria, in the super in the all colonial settings, right, they have much more differentiated racial hierarchies in which you can move up and down. So it would be interesting to work out you know, I mean, I don't know how much you can put in all that project, but it would be interesting to see. So what's the difference? If you're at the bottom and, and you have to negotiate from the lowest position vis a vis, you know, at least we're above the Muslims, now we're being dropped down, so it must have a very different impact. Yeah. 
on 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 those people. I think that would be something of interest. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's a follow up. Yeah. Sure. I think because you know because of you know Jews of French nationality were able to take their nationality. We're also subject, of course, to the uh, you know the racist laws, the metropolitan press. So what would then really be the distinction between them and those who Jews who became then subjects? So I'm wondering. I mean, beyond the symbolic level, which I can understand, in, in, a, in a practical sense, do they really enjoy, at this point, more rights? Uh, I guess that's what I just... And Sonia is asking the last question. And my question or comment is also connected to what Daniel and Suzanne said. You know, if, I, if we are in, interested in the jewish Muslim relations uh, through this uh, through the prism of this period, I think we have to, you know, we, we, I wouldn't miss this, uh, this, uh, you know, this uh, period to see what that, what they built to the relationship, and uh, and then I will go to this, uh, the, the Algerian Jews who crossed to Morocco, and uh, and the reading, you know, there are two readings, two kind of reading to see what happened there. There are the, re the there is the reading of the. The archival material, but there is also another reading, uh, which I will call it an anthropological reading. The anthropological reading, so we have a situation where Algerian Jews, French, culturally, I would call it, you know, with French habitus, moving, crossing the border and becoming something else in Morocco. And they are becoming culturally or anthropologically becoming French in Morocco. Which, which are, which means they are, they, oh, they, they arrive in Morocco, they run from Algeria, they run away, and when they come in Morocco, they find maybe not legally, but culturally, they, they are in super, in superior situation, with the, the Moroccan looking at them as a French, and they were, you know, they, they live in European, uh, in the Red Nouvelle, and the Moroccan took them for French, the Moroccan Jews and Muslims. They for them they were French. They didn't look, they didn't check their identity card. But it, the way they behave in the colonial uh, colonial space, they behave exactly like Frenchmen, with the trippy suit, with the beret, with the everything and the and you know um, um, our friend uh, Simon Livet, you know, he, he, he really described this, uh, this, uh, this atmosphere in the middle of Fez. Sometimes he told me, you know, there were actually no Europeans, but he's exaggerating. He told me no Europeans, only Algerian Jews. And uh, everybody told us. So you have also to see this kind of anthropological uh, atmosphere in the, with the people who cross the border. And to all these Could I just uh, say one thing? My impression is, and I'm not really terribly well seated in this issue, is these uh, French, these Algerian Jews have very complex identities. Yes. They were very multifaceted people. They weren't just simply French. Yes. They were lots of other things. So I'm just wondering. But what uh, reserves they had, what they, what other kinds of identities they could resort to when stripped of this one uh, stable factor in their lives. Uh, I think it, it would make your readings of the letters um, uh, more, more nuanced, perhaps, if you, mm -hmm. if you could bring into play all of these um, uh, various, these multifaceted personalities, because I'm thinking of, in particular, this wonderful new book, it's not new, it's, it's about 10 years old, by a man named Dunyganun. It's called um, Semi. It's, a, it's been translated from French. He shows how his father, who's an Algerian Jew, a teacher, very French, but also a communist, uh, a member of the, uh, uh, you know, in the French army, uh, a supporter of Muslim causes, a, a very prototypical uh, person who had an extremely multi Fascinating personality, and when he was stripped of his French citizenship through the, uh, uh, the, the loss of the, you know, the, 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 uh, the 
recession of a permanent increase. We became other things. Mm -hmm. And I'm just wondering if you could think about that as, a, as an option in, in, yeah. in reading these things. Sorry, yes. it's a, it's a off the scale here. But. Yeah, Whew. OK. So I mean, thank you, first of all, everyone, for such really helpful and thought-provoking feedback. Especially as I begin this project, this is very helpful to have these questions to work through and think through. Um, I guess I'm going to try to answer them in like thematic groups rather than specific questions uh, in the interest of trying to make it through everything. Um, going to this issue of multiple identities, and I think this covers many questions that were asked here. This is an important issue. The multiple identities, because there were indeed multiple identities, and this also gets back to Alma's question of diversity among Algerian Jews. They were not homogeneous. There, there was not just one form of Algerian Jew. There were, they were incredibly diverse as a community. I mean, we had different socioeconomic class. We had, um, we had different education levels. We had different political leanings. We had different. I mean, even geography, where they lived. Did they live near Muslims? And if so, how did that impact their relationships? Others did not. Others were living in more of the city centers. So there is enormous diversity to this. And uh, I, at this stage, I haven't been able to deal with that adequately. But it, I've been toying with the idea of maybe when I structure the book itself, trying to come up with different communities and looking at how these different communities responded within the Algerian Jewish community more broadly. So that's that's definitely a big issue. And, and the issue of nationality and citizenship as well is one that's very complicated and constantly does not make sense to people. There is a question always in letters, but also in the administrative files of, are they citizens? Are they French nationals? Are they still French nationals? Are they not? I think that the, there's a lot of these questions. and. Many of the letters fall upon a French rhetoric, particularly one that reflects the French education. And that we can see across the board, regardless of other backgrounds, other identities, that is common in these letters. But we also have to understand these letters as a particular source. Most of the appeals going to the government are seeking to maintain citizenship. So there's a very particular outcome. So we have to understand what they're trying to do in that letter, and that it is perhaps performative, which comes back to the question that I asked Orit yesterday, that these may not be reflective of all the identities, but it reflects one particular effort. And even the letters between family members may kind of veer towards a particular format. Again, you know, another interesting element will be looking into more newspaper articles, seeing how Jews are talking to each other in that format. Other, you know, I'd love to be able to try to understand what happened in cafes. How did they talk to one another? These are all issues that I, I can't yet get at, and I've just been using these letters as a source. But nuancing the reading of them is very important. Um, in terms of Derrida and that quote that I gave you, there are two pieces that I, I wanted to use it for. One is that this idea that citizenship, in theory, should never be precarious, as he said. It should not be able to be taken away. And the fact that it was, was indeed a shock for Jews. And that led to the sense of rupture. The other is the blame. Who's responsible? And the fact that he very clearly says that Vichy is responsible, that this was no, there was not any other source of this, is a real critique, and a very strong critique that eventually is shared among other Algerian Jews. But at the time, there's a, a an idea that we're looking for the true friends. So the, I, I wrote about Operation Torch in my previous work. And those Jews who are involved in Operation Torch are very clear that they want to bring back true friends. And that Vichy is an aberration. It's something different. And that they can remain patriots despite what Vichy is doing because Vichy is not friends. And, and we see that in the letters as well. Uh, I think I've. I yeah, can't get anything else. Yeah, absolutely. It makes sense. It's very logical. <laughs> but we see that in the other letters of those who were not part of the liberation movement, that Vichy is not really the France that they've known, and that this is a different kind of France. And the issue of the French Cologne, the Jew, I mean, the, the Cologne, and especially the 
immigrants from Italy and Malta and Spain, there's a lot of anti-Semitism and a lot of long-standing anti-Semitism in the colony. And uh, it comes out in a higher degree under Vichy because it's acceptable. And it, it, it also helps to create further divides and between different groups who have been competing with one another in the colony. So it becomes an opportunity to kind of put Jews in their place. Um, that doesn't mean there was also not a lot of cooperation and community that was formed. Uh, and I, uh, yeah. You couldn't you, you didn't some of them know, or you think perhaps that, like, are you not getting a sense that maybe that it was all the Germans who were putting in the strings, and that really, you know, oh, we know that Vichy is really good and that France is wonderful, but we're, we're being persecuted by another force and we're really fringe. Are you getting a sense of that at all? There is a sense of that, but there's also, you know, we again have to take these letters for what they are. If they're writing to Vichy, they're not going to say, you know, you're not really true France. There's, there's kind of a, an, an embrace of the Vichy rhetoric, which probably is artificial and probably performative. But there, yeah, but I, you know, we have to understand what the outcome is. Letters between people are different, and I'm out of time. But we can all keep discussing this at our different breaks. <laughs> I'm taking over your job, sorry. <laughs> Thank you for your questions, and our next speaker is...